consider buying your processed oboe and bassoon cane from those friendly folks over at Barton Cane. Processed with care and precision for your everyday reed making needs. Take the pain and injury out of reed making by letting Barton Cane do the hard, repetitive, boring stuff. Free up time for practicing, happy hours, hikes, baking, and spending time with friends and family. Barton Cane, here for you. Visit www.bartoncane.com. Ugly Duckling Oboes is dedicated to the development of young oboe players. They provide quality handmade oboe reeds, private lessons, and high quality oboe sales, rentals, and consignments. The oboes that they rent are conservatory mechanism oboes that include the left hand F key and low B flat key. All are maintained by oboe specific technicians. In person lessons are available as well as virtual lessons for students who live outside the geographic area or have transportation and scheduling challenges. They also offer online college audition coaching for high school juniors and seniors who plan to audition to be music majors. Visit uglyducklingoboes.com for more details on how you can set up yourself for success and sign up for their newsletter. That's uglyducklingoboes.com. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Read Dish, a podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. Galit is sick. I am sick. I sound like Steve Buscemi with a cold. (laughs) Well, you know, he is my celebrity crush. (laughs) (laughs) I'm coming to you from COVID 2022. I'm on day four of a fever. But don't worry, everyone. I'm okay. I do not need hospitalization. I'm just a whiny, miserable, sick person. Well, tell the listeners how you're passing your time while recovering from COVID. (laughs) (laughs) Did you suggest this to me? I'm sure I have. I'm I'm like evangelical for this particular uh, viewing (laughs) pleasure. This is the best suggestion I've ever gotten. So if it was from someone else who's listening and not, I'm sorry to give Jackie the credit, but uh, I have been binging Jersey Shore, (laughs) which is my new obsession. I'm in season three. (laughs) First of all, I'm a reality TV connoisseur. Uh And the Jersey Shore is like definitely in my top five shows of all time. I've done, I've watched it several times through. (laughs) So she keeps texting me like when she gets to a certain point and (laughs) like, oh, have you gotten to the fight about Sammy's big toe? And she's like, yes. Oh my gosh, I'm at the note. I was actually, maybe I should do a rewatch because you're putting me in the mood to rewatch Jersey Shore. (laughs) This is some of the best television I've ever seen. And I don't know why it's taken me so long. When was it filmed? Uh, Like early 2000s? It was still airing when I was in my doctorate. So around 2008, 2011. It is such a beautiful nugget of a certain group of people in a certain period of time in a certain place I just can't get over it I am devoured it's actually making COVID kind of fun (laughs) well and if you're on season three then that means next season is season four when they go to Florence and dedicated listeners will remember that I walked through by no choice of my own the streets of Milan barefoot and referenced Jay Wow walking through the streets of Florence barefoot, and you were like, I have no idea what you're referencing, but soon you will. Oh and- God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot wait. Like, also, just a casual observation I did not realize how much Jackie has been culturally influenced by Snooki. <laughs> I mean, we are, uh, 
if we were dogs, we'd be considered the same breed. Right? <laughs> You're like the same height. Yes. You both go, what? We're both brown. Uh, you both are in love with animal print. It's true. <laughs> I take that as a very high compliment. I'll tell you, I'm the Snooky of the bassoon world. Oh, gosh. I hope that doesn't That's catch legit. on. <laughs> <laughs> if you're snooky then who am i uh i can see you being jenny jenny my tall friend who although snooky your tall ride or die is yes in that way you're my jenny but snooky is dependent on jenny like you're dependent on me like the right. reliance within the friendship is the right. opposite <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> I support this revelation, even if it comes 15 years late. (laughs) And I'm sure the listeners appreciate our timely pop culture references and commentary. (laughs) I was physically, emotionally, and spiritually not ready for it 15 years ago. It was ahead of its time. I'm ready now. (laughs) It's the rite of spring of reality television oh my god it really is <laughs> what are you up to <laughs> i'm good i uh, so we're recording this on the 14th which means tomorrow was to be my official end of my break if you remember i gave myself the first through the 15th of august completely off from the bassoon and yesterday i was like i miss it and it sounds fun to play and I want to play. And then I was like, well, I guess the point of a break is to, you know, get to that point. And I felt like I had, you know, really gotten some time to myself and I don't know about recuperate, but yeah. So I started, I didn't actually make it all the way through the break. I missed, I missed the bassoon and I played a little bit, but what I will say is, I don't know if you relate to this, but whenever I have a break, like summer vacation or winter vacation as an academic, a lot of times I just like put so many things on my to-do list for what I hope to accomplish in that break. You're stabbing me in the heart right now. That just like, it's unrealistic. Like, (laughs) And then you're more stressed out (laughs) than you were during the school year. Yeah, I I went in like, okay, IDRS is over. It's time to get in back to school mode. And I haven't gotten X, Y, and Z done. So I don't even know that it was really a break as much as it was like, okay, I got to try to stockpile reads. And I got to try to get this done. And I got to try to get that done. And I haven't done the blah. And then I was like, I actually woke up today and I was like, I think I'm just going to take some things off of the list. Like... I really wanted to stockpile 200 blanks going into the year. 200? I know. I know. I know. I'm not going to act like it's not ridiculous and unforgiving of myself. And I've gotten like 70 done. And I looked at Chris and I was like, I think I just need to say 70 is good and cross it off the list and not like torture myself feeling like a failure to make more reads than I could possibly get through in the next 15 weeks. Yeah. So anyway, we've, you know, we've talked about kindness and, and trying to be better about ourselves and our relationship to work. And so um, I don't know that I totally did that so well in terms of like ambition of what I wanted to get off my plate coming into this break, but coming out of it, I'm kind of like, okay, you tried. And now it's time to be realistic and go into the school year with something that is remotely manageable. Are you even going to play 70 reads? I don't know. I think. (laughs) I feel like you're good. You're good for the rest of the year. I think I must be, or at least so Christmas break, right? But Uh, it's just, yeah, yeah. you're in this ambitious mode at the beginning of the summer where it's like, I'm going to renovate every single room in my house. Yeah, make 200 reads. I'm going to learn 200 pieces. I'm going to heal world hunger. And I'm going to become a zillionaire. And that's what I'm going to do with my summer. And it's like, okay, well, great. Good job. I didn't do any of those things. But <laughs> oh, I was also going to get my entire third year review done. Oh, my God. <laughs> that didn't happen either. 
But I got a nice it's chunk of the way through. Three? It is. I'm going into year three, and oh. that review is really extensive. And I did not get it all the way done, but I got a big chunk. And so I guess all of this is just to say I'm trying to do a good job of not going, ooh, you didn't get it done, but going, look how much you did get done. Yeah, you gave yourself a really solid head start. Exactly. And I'm trying to just reframe it that way and be mature about it. Mm, um, it. How did your break go? Obviously, COVID put a little bit of a damper on it, but... Yeah, the first week of it was good. Although I did text you before I got COVID and I was like, it feels really uncomfortable not playing. Like, I kind of want to play. But then I ended up scratching that itch by processing a pound of cane and... um making some blanks so i have some blanks not 200 i have like eight <laughs> blanks waiting for me i got inspired by the lee munoz interview where she talked about making 700 reads in five oh minutes or whatever <laughs> i like was proud of myself for like tying eight blanks and processing <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah i um have been struggling a little bit with my voicing and my playing lately. Like I just feel a lot of throat tension. Mm -hmm. Um, but then my last performance at IDRS, the one I did with my colleague, Kim Woolley, my voicing felt incredible, mm -hmm. uh, and so comfortable mm -hmm. and it felt kind of like a breakthrough. Um, and so I was like a little bit itchy to get back to that, but obviously now I just have to wait. Yeah. But I, I think that's actually good practice because if you get it once, you can get it again. And you're not ever supposed to recreate something that you've done in the past. You're supposed to just move constantly toward what feels good and natural. Yeah. And this relationship we have with our instruments is such an ebb and flow. How, okay, let's end on maybe something you're excited about or how you're feeling going into the new academic year? Well, I'm very excited to not have a fever anymore. And uh, I'm so excited. Last night I bought my plane tickets to go up to Washington State <laughs> and record our album. So I'm super, super excited about the album and then the tour, the Midwestern tour that we have coming up. Yes, we will be this September at... Washington State University, University of Kansas, University of Arkansas, University of Iowa, and the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Holy moly. That is all in a six-day span. We're going to be falling over by the end of it. But do you think that it's like this tour is going to be like us going to the Jersey Shore? Yeah, <laughs> it will be an extremely intense period of time where we're focused on one particular thing. And to make it even more Jersey Shore-ish, we will be there with an Italian, my colleague <gasps> Fabio Menchetti. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> and so he can teach us like Italian phrases. Actually, I've, t I've bugged him that he needs to watch the Jersey Shore and he just looks at me like I'm the saddest person he's ever uh, deemed to call his friend. So <laughs> maybe we can get Fabio to watch the Jersey Shore while we're on tour. I'm so excited. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Chemical City Double Reads is a full-service double read shop specializing in the sale of instruments, cane, accessories, and sheet music. Double Read Dish listeners can enjoy free shipping with code DRDISH, all caps, no spaces. Visit them in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or online at chemicalcityreads.com. Hey, oboists. Have you ever found it difficult to sort out when and how to find a new oboe or English horn? Oboe Chicago streamlines the process, providing personal and professional consultation and a large selection of lovely instruments. The process feels comfortable and thorough. Selection includes F. Fleuret of Paris, Howarth of London, Covey Oboes, and Fox products. For a current listing of Obo Chicago selection, please visit www.oboechicago.com. For a credit of $100 toward shipping, mention Double Read Dish when you call or email Shauna.
we are so excited to welcome to Double Read Dish, Emily Brebach, who plays English horn and oboe in the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. Welcome to Double Read Dish. Thank you so much for having me. Um, can we hear how you started to play the oboe? How did you come to this instrument? Sure. So I grew up in a very musical family. Both my parents um, have PhDs in English, but they both play instruments. My mom was a very serious pianist all through high school and college. And my father um, is a flute player. Um, and he, uh, he plays in a bunch of community bands and, and does that whole, that whole thing. Um, so they were very invested in music all through my life, even before I started playing an instrument. So I think I was about six, six years old when I started um, playing the piano, and that lasted for a few years. And then when I turned nine, I got into fourth grade, and they have the band program starts. Um, I grew up outside of Philadelphia, so they start you in band around fourth grade there. So I um, was trying out a bunch of instruments, and um, I didn't know this, but both my parents were like, okay, come on, oboe, come on, come on, oboe. I come home, and anybody who knows me who hears this is going to be shocked to hear this because I don't tell the story very often. But I came home and was like, mom and dad, guess what? I'm going to play the trombone. <laughs> <laughs> and mom was like, no, you're not. <laughs> Go back to school and ask the band director if you can try the oboe. And I was like, okay. Uh, <laughs> so I go back to school the next day and I go to the band director and I was like, can I try the oboe? And he's like, I mean, sure. Like, I guess it, it probably wasn't very often that you have a nine-year-old showing up to your office asking to play the oboe. So I, I, he put a read in and I played and I got, I got more notes out than he thought um, that, you know, that, that people normally do when they try and play the oboe. I'm like, Oh, actually this is going to be a good fit. You're going to play the oboe. So I started then I started that summer, actually the summer before fourth grade. Um, and I did like the summer band program with my elementary school and I started taking lessons right away. Um, and it just sort of took off from there. I just have, I have this like image in my mind of you like sound asleep the night before instrument trials and your parents just like whispering, oh, wow. I know. <laughs> from the next room. Like, oh, wow. um, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it was fun. I mean, you know, my, uh, we played, you know, I did not have the, I think what a lot of people would think of as like a normal upbringing, like we played trio sonatas together, you know, in the living room. And, you know, at some point, I don't remember if it was right when I started playing the oboe or very soon after um, my mom acquired a harpsichord. So we got rid of the couch in the living room and there was a (laughs) harpsichord. couches out and the harpsichord came in there's a piano and like they would like they would have friends come over and play like recorder quartets and like it was a very a very quirky musical upbringing and of course we went to I grew up outside of Philadelphia so we would go and see the Philadelphia Orchestra a lot I remember going to the Mann Center when I was you know eight nine ten years old which is the the outdoor summer home of the Philadelphia Orchestra um so music was just a really big part of, of my parents' life. Um, and it became a big part of mine also once I started, once I started playing, because once I started um, taking lessons, I got involved in um, groups outside of, um, outside of, you know, my school band. I, I played uh, woodwind quintet starting in like fifth grade uh, with the Settlement Music School program in Philadelphia. They have a woodwind quintet um, program during the year so every Saturday I would go downtown and play in a woodwind quintet and I did youth orchestra I did a whole bunch of youth orchestras I got I got very invested very uh very soon um my next question was going to be so what lit the fire for you to become a professional (laughs) musician but I'm guessing that's it yeah actually the the one the one thing that does stick out the one story that really kind of I I would I'd say sealed the deal but I think if I said that back back to like 12 year old Emily she would have been like no I don't know what I want to do um but I remember my very first youth orchestra rehearsal I was I think in like seventh grade it was the Delaware County Youth Orchestra outside of Philadelphia and the first rehearsal you know I was expecting it to be like very um uh I don't know organizational or something like this is this is your music this is how a rehearsal is going to be run this is like lots of talking and not a lot of playing and instead like we walk in the music's on the stand like you're you know you, you knew where you were sitting and like okay you know welcome to the Valerie County Youth Orchestra we're going to start with Beethoven 5 da, 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 da. and I was like oh <laughs> <laughs> like my brain went like this I'd never played in an orchestra before I was playing second oboe on Beethoven 5 and it was just like it was just the coolest thing and I I think um, I, I really fell in love with with orchestral playing uh, at that point. And it was it was um, I think that, I, you know, the 
contrarian in me was probably like, oh, well, I, I don't know, maybe I want to do something else. I'm not sure that, it, but it, that's pretty much when, when my mind was made up. That's amazing. So can you walk us through your training and educational journey? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like I said, I was, I was doing a whole lot of extracurricular music stuff when I was in uh, middle and high school. Um, and I, I was studying with uh, Lou Rosenblatt, who was the English horn player of, well, he had just retired as English horn player of the Philadelphia Orchestra. Um, so I studied with him through high school and then I applied for college as a double degree student. So again, like the contrarian, you know, I was like, I don't know if I want to do this, but also my parents were, were a little nervous about me going into music. You know, it's, it's a scary thing to send your kid off into this, this field that can be, um, you know, sometimes eats, eats a person and choose, choose them up and, and spits them out. Um, so I applied double degree to a whole bunch of places and I ended up at Oberlin for my undergrad with James Caldwell. Um, and I very quickly realized again, that like, you know, like music is, music is really what I want to be doing. So I dropped the double degree and graduated in four years instead of the five. Um, and then I went to Rice University, uh, in Houston, um, for my master's degree, study with Bob Atherholt there while he was still principal oboe of the Houston Symphony. So that was kind of an important transition that I wanted to make. Um, my, when I was at Oberlin, Mr. Caldwell had retired from playing. So he wasn't performing. I didn't hear him perform any concerts or chamber music or anything. Um, I was obviously going to, you know, driving into Cleveland at every opportunity to go hear the Cleveland Orchestra um, and listening to all my other um, colleagues, you know, my, not my colleagues, my teachers, um, you know, perform, uh, at, at Oberlin. Um, but I wasn't hearing my teacher play. And I had, I kept thinking to myself, I want to study with someone for my master's degree, who's in the trenches, who's doing this day to day in, day out. And I want to see what that looks like. And I want to study with someone who's, who's doing that. Um, so rice was a perfect fit for me in that, in that regard. Um, I, I could go see my teacher every week, play with the Houston Symphony and, you know, I'd have lessons with him like the day after or the day of the concert. And I just hear all the ins and out of, outs of what he was doing and see, you know, what it took both on a preparation level, but also on a read making level. That was a big thing that I was, um, I was missing that I needed to kind of figure out was the, the read making aspect of it. So I, um, I did that. Uh, I started taking auditions when I was in grad school, all of them unsuccessful. <laughs> um, and then I graduated from Rice and I stuck around Houston uh, for three years. So I was lucky to, um, for one, that they needed subs in the Houston Symphony. So I got to sub with the Houston Symphony a bunch right after I graduated from my master's degree. Um, I was teaching a whole boatload of students. Um, there's a, a big public school music culture in Houston, in and around Houston. So I had something like 35 private oboe students. Um, yeah, it was a lot. And it taught me a lot, right? It was really great to be able to learn how to teach, how to teach a variety of different levels, um, how to teach, uh, how to keep all of that straight and how to make reads for all those students too. That was a huge thing too, just be able to like crank out the reads for the kids um, on a regular basis. So I really feel like after I graduated, I, I knew that I knew what I needed to work on in my playing. Um, and having somebody tell me that week in and week out was not helping. <laughs> like I knew what I needed to do. I needed to check in with a teacher once a month, once every few months, some, like when an audition was coming up, something like that. Um, but having someone tell me like every week, your reads need to be better, you know, your pitch needs to be better, whatever it was. I was like, yep, still working on that. It's not going to happen in a week. I <laughs> so feel it was that very deeply. <laughs> <laughs> and I know a lot of people who kind of flounder when, after they graduate from a master's degree, if they don't, or whatever degree, if they don't have more schooling, if they don't have that weekly check-in. For me, it was just, it was so great to just be able to kind of sit back and deal with myself, um, you know, long-term and go to a teacher when I, when I needed them and not just have like a weekly, that weekly check-in. Um, so making the reads for the students was really, um, really kind of formative for me and being able to, to figure out how to do that for myself also, how to just like make a read that functions. Um, and subbing with Houston a ton was really, really great too. And then, um, kind of my third or I guess fourth major teacher, I would say, um, kind of came into the picture at this point. It was, uh, Rob Walters who plays English horn in the Cleveland orchestra. And I had met him my senior year at Oberlin. That was his first year in the Cleveland Orchestra. Um, 
And I had kept in touch with him. Um, but after I graduated, I would fly up to, to Cleveland every, you know, before an audition and play audition lists for him, as well as obviously, you know, keeping checked in with, with Bob Atherholt. Um, but I kind of like, you know, I guess uh, Mr. Caldwell taught me how to, how to play music. Um, you know, Mr. Atherholt taught me how to, how to survive in the orchestra world. And Rob Walters taught me how to win an audition. That's kind of how I, how I think about it. And he was, he was wonderful about um, audition prep. And I think, um, I, I think you've had a couple of Rob Walters students on here and he's just like the, the king of audition prep. It was, it was really wonderful to be able to, to do that. So I would be in Houston, you know, four days a week, I would, I'd teach, you know, eight lessons, four days a week, um, starting at three 30 or whatever, the more I get up in the morning and make reads and practice from like nine to two. And then I would get in the car and I would drive out to the suburbs and I teach eight lessons and I come home and I do it all over the next day. And it was, it was a really, a really great time for me to figure myself out as a player. And it took three years. Um, and I'm not, I was certainly not a finished product at the end of those three years, but I did want a job. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I have a couple of follow-up questions. Um, yeah. I guess let's go backwards. Um, so could you tell us some of the things that you learned about audition prep from Robert Walters uh, that resonated with you? Yeah. Um, let's see. So one of the big things, the big takeaway, oh, I have lots of like Rob Walters quotes that I find myself saying out loud to my students. One of them is if it makes musical sense and it makes your life easier, you have no reason not to do it. (laughs) (laughs) Which I love. So what that kind of leads into is finding musical solutions to technical problems. Um, That's a, that's a big thing. Like being able to, um, if you're, Mm. you know, coming up against something technical, that's, that's giving you trouble. Like, is there a way that you can make it find a musical solution instead of just like beating your head against the technique constantly. Like there are, there are multiple ways to, you know, to, to come at a problem or to, to address a problem. Right. Another one that he was really great about was kind of expanding my view of excerpts, not as like hoops to jump through necessarily, but uh, like truly trying to see the, the greater musical context. Um, so one of the ways that he was really great about doing that is he would always find another piece that you should listen to, to, um, to get into the right mood for a solo work or for a, for an excerpt. So one of my favorite examples of that is before I won my job here in Atlanta, the solo piece was the, was the Donizetti, Donizetti concertino, um, which is just a, a really, uh, you know, wonderful showpiece, but it's Donizetti, right? So Donizetti is known for his opera, uh, writing. So he told me, he's like, well, you need to just go listen to a bunch of coloratura sopranos. I was like, okay. Um, so I listened to, um, of course, now I'm blanking on it. Uh, Cecilia Barsley. I listened to a ton of Cecilia Barsley to get into the right, you know, like diva, um, you know, like absolute total control, like one, like badass of a, <laughs> of a singer um, to get into that mood for the Donizetti instead of just listening to a whole bunch of different recordings of the Donizetti. Like that's important too. So you understand, but to get outside of the, the issues of the instrument itself and listen to, for the music right which I know like yeah that's an easy thing to say but if you listen to you know the uh, Dvorak American Quartet when you're trying to prep for Dvorak New World you're not thinking about it's like oh well that English horn player are they going to get that you know like how are their A flats going to be in tune like how is their you know you're not you're not kind of like so stuck in the um in the intricacies of your specific instrument you're listening to the music instead and it gives you a really interesting and new perspective so those are those are two um two things that he did. He also was really good at um, uh, doing what he would call adversity training with me. <laughs> so I remember this one time I was at his house and I was playing an audition list and he was, um, he was dog sitting for a friend <laughs> and he just let the dog just jump all over me the entire <laughs> time I was playing. This is like a very like active dog. I was like just trying to play and, and, and he, the dog started to jump on me. He's like, oh wait, no, no, we're gonna, we're gonna let that happen. We're gonna... <laughs> You're, you're still going to play that list and you're with this dog jumping on you. The so dog's like, this is the best day of my life. <laughs> it's like, it's all, all, it was all but like I was covered in dog treats or something. Like this dog was, was I remember this dog trying to play specifically um, uh, Pines of Rome with this dog just like <laughs> jumping on my leg the entire time. So 
it was all like, I mean, I knew how to play the excerpts by that point. Like I knew, I knew how to do all, but it was just that, that last bit of like being able to overcome any kind of weird situation I find myself in, like becoming more, more than just a excerpt machine execution bot and like being a, you know, a musician who plays music, <laughs> which I know can, can sometimes feel like the, what an audition is like the last, the last thing you're thinking about is a musician playing music <laughs> sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so those, those things were really instrumental. Oh, and the reads too, like, man, he was like, uh, like always on top of making sure that I had like just a ton of different reads and was really paying attention to like the consistency in my read making. Cause that, that was, again, just a huge thing for me to try and figure out. Mm-hmm. Um, my next follow-up question is about James Caldwell, you know, unfortunately yeah. we'll never be able to talk to him, but I know we can talk to his students. So are there any stories about James Caldwell that you'd be willing to share with us? Yeah. Oh man. Caldwell, he, he was, he was just the, the consummate musician. Like he just like music, he, he loved music and in any form. It just happened that he played the oboe, I think, is what it felt like. He also played the viola da gamba. Um, and he was very big in, uh, my understanding is that he was very big in bringing um, period instruments and, and um, historical performance practice to the United States. Um, he was just, he, he was, <laughs> he had like, I remember when I first got into Oberlin, um, Mr. Rosenblatt showed me this, this picture, this like what he called computer art, right? So this is like, you know, 2001. So it was computer art, um, <laughs> this newfangled thing um, <laughs> of, 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 um, it was, of like a, a purple swan on a, on a lake with these like purple mountains in the background that Caldwell had, had made and sent to him. And it was, oh, this is the swan of Tuanella that he made for me. And um he like he I think he made like kimonos or something like he was just he was such a renaissance man and like just such a like he just loved art and beauty and and making things beautiful um in in so many different um avenues of his life um yeah he was I I remember (laughs) my very first lesson with him when I was a senior in high school and I was going to take trial trial lessons with people I played um I think I played like a telemon something by Telemann, a Telemann fantasy or something like that for him. And he spent like 40 minutes talking about Tai Chi in my lesson about, and he kept like moving around, like really slow and like, just like you're standing up and like doing all of this. And, but that's just how his mind worked. Like he would, he would see these connections between, between music and, and um, all these different sorts of art forms. And like that, I think that was what really, um, really drove him at least when I when I was there because again like I said he wasn't he wasn't performing very much but so he, but he was just like he was just such a an artist a true artist mm-hmm. was the English horn always a part of your professional aspirations and um you know could we hear maybe about audition prep and just doing your job in terms of balancing both uh, mm. This may be a long answer and that's totally okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, man, if I had a good answer to the balance thing, <laughs> my life would be so much less stressful. <laughs> um, so you may have noticed that two of my major teachers were English one players in big five orchestras. Right. Um, and that's just pure chance. I think I, you know, I didn't really play a lot of English horn with Mr. Rosenblatt and with Rob, I was doing whatever audition came up. So principal, second, English horn, opera, ballet, whatever uh, audition I was, I was prepping for, I would play for him. Um, But I did always kind of have an affinity for the English horn. My high school had one. um, And because I was like the only oboe player um, in the school, like I kind of co-opted it for the four years that I was there. So I was, you know, if you own an English horn or if you have access to an English horn, you will play English horn. Like that's just <laughs> kind of how it works. Like, it's like, who, who has one? Oh, you, okay. So you're going to play English horn in youth orchestra, like this concert. Um, so I always, I, I had it and I, I liked it, but I didn't necessarily think this is what I want to do. Um, for the rest of my life. I, I like to say that the day I decided that I wanted to be a professional English horn player was the day I won my job in the Atlanta symphony, <laughs> 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 you know, like, like at that point I was like, I, you know, I'll, I, I had taken so many auditions. I was like, I'll, 
where where can I win uh, gainful employment? That was my <laughs> that was my like. Give me the contract, goal. I'll sign. You want to right, play? Yeah. You want me to play third right. recorder? And this, <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. Whatever. Right. <laughs> totally. You're right. Um, but sir, I mean, it, like looking back, it does make it does make poetic sense. Like, yes, I played a lot of English horn in in high school and in college. Yes, two of my major teachers were English horn players. Like this, this is not going to surprise anybody that I ended up being an English horn player, but I don't, I don't know that it was, I I didn't feel like I had the luxury to be that niche Mm -hmm. when I was trying to get a job. Um, or when I was trying to, I, at that point, right before I got here, I played, um, for two seasons with the Sarasota orchestra, second oboe and occasional English horn. Um, so it was just like, you know, wherever, wherever I can, you know, whoever will hire me, I will, I will do that job. Um, but it is a really good fit for me. I really do love playing English horn. Um, another, see, Rob Walters, his quotes just come out of my mouth all the time. So one of the things he says about playing the English horn, it's a little bit less like threading a needle. Um, <laughs> you know, the reeds are more forgiving. Um, you know, the, the, the solos are just fantastic. I mean, we just have the best repertoire. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's not as, um, not as much like walking on a tightrope. I don't feel like I feel a lot more comfortable playing playing English horn than I do playing playing oboe. Though you know, I still play a lot of oboe and really do enjoy playing oboe. But English horn is where my home is. And in terms of you asked about balance and audition prep, I don't have a good answer, unfortunately. <laughs> it's um, I mean, you know how you go through, you know, playing slumps. Sometimes the playing is up, sometimes the playing is down. Sometimes the reeds are up, sometimes the reeds are down. Now put that over two instruments and they don't always line up. And I I honestly don't know that that's like the big um, uh, stressor in my career is is trying to find that balance. Because I do play a fair amount of oboe and I teach a whole lot of oboe. Um, So I have to I have to have both instruments up, you know, and in shape and good reeds all at the at the same time. Um, and that's, you know, sometimes the reed gods just don't, just don't smile upon you <laughs> with two different instruments. Um, I do have, so when I auditioned here in Atlanta, they asked, um, I, f- I think that we didn't have to play oboe in the first round. Um, and then in the second round that I played, they asked for oboe. And I remember the downstairs of the Woodruff Arts Center where the Atlanta Symphony plays, um, there's not really any good soundproofing between the rooms. So you can hear what everybody else is doing and warming up, which is like super, super awesome for the, for the, for the nerves. Um, <laughs> but I remember that like, you know, they, they put us in separate rooms and they gave us the list and said, okay, well, you're going to have to play. Um, you know, the first thing I want to hear is oboe. And I, I remember I could like basically hear the cobwebs of everyone like opening their oboe case, like <laughs> <laughs> and taking out their oboe and everyone's like, oh, okay, let's see if the reads are working today. Cause we'd all been, you know, focused on English foreign. Like that's, that's what we had been doing. So it's, I, I, I don't, I honestly don't have a good answer. And maybe, I don't know if that's um, solace to anybody who's a student to, to know that we don't have it all figured out or if it's like, oh man, this is going to be the rest of my life, but <laughs> Or maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> but I, I certainly do not have a have a, a system figured out. You know, I've I've gotten I've gotten better at managing it, but I wouldn't say that it, that like that's my my strongest suit as a musician. Right. Um, well, so you told us a little bit about the day, but we always love to hear uh, the story of how people like won their gig. So can we hear more about what that day? was like and winning your job so I started in the semifinals and that round was just English horn the next the final round there was like I don't know five or five or six of us there and uh we had to play a little bit of oboe and English horn and um, at the end of the of that day they, they whittled it down from the five or six down to three um and they said we want you three to come back and do what they call an excerpt round with the orchestra so they look at everyone's schedules and figured it all out. And we were all going to come back in six weeks, um, fly back to Atlanta and play four excerpts with the orchestra. So there's three of us playing four. So that meant that for six weeks, I practiced four excerpts <laughs> and it was a little crazy making. Um, it was, <laughs> it was William Tell, um, La Mer, second movement of La Mer, um, uh, New World, obviously, right? You always have to play New World, and um, and then the last one was Rob Roy. God, that's a which, hard one. It really is, but you know, it's at the same time as a harp solo. 
So yeah. all what, what all of these excerpts had that I didn't realize, which I discovered during those six weeks is they're all, they all have um, pretty important other stuff going on at the same time. And a lot of times on English horn solos, we just think that like everyone sits back quietly and waits for us to play our solo and then they, they go on their way. And that's often what it feels like. Um, but Rob Roy specifically was, um, it has such a really wonderful harp part that goes along with it. And this is something that, uh, so I met with Pat McFarland, my predecessor, after I won the job uh, and moved here. And I, I was telling him about this. And he's like, oh, yeah, Rob Roy. I never played that one. He was English horn in the Atlanta Symphony for like 47 years or something like that. Never performed it. I don't I don't think I know anybody who's performed it. Um, it's, I've only had to learn it for one audition one time. Yeah, it's it's, it's audition fodder. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, so. Uh, I was living in Sarasota at the time. I was the second oboist of the Sarasota Orchestra. And uh, in Sarasota, um, there's a a 10 week long uh, opera festival called the Sarasota Opera, which I had actually played with prior to winning my job in the Sarasota Orchestra. Um, So there's, they have a harpist there. There's a harpist in the orchestra. So I had multiple harp players who were around during that time that I forced to learn this piece so that they could play it with me. Um, During the La Mer excerpt, there's a big um, glockenspiel excerpt at the same time as the La Mer solo in the second movement of of um of that piece so I had a friend who was uh taking a bunch of percussion auditions at the time um so he played that with me and it was you know that was really great it's, it's great to kind of get out of the like you know playing in a room by yourself feeling right I had to do something so that I didn't go crazy over those four weeks um or six weeks excuse me um so I played I played those excerpts uh, with him. Um, my now husband is a cellist. I made him, I made him play, um, uh, William Tell with me, actually, I, I, the flute players, right? I played a lot of with the flute players, but he was, so he's sitting there and you know what the, the cellos do during that time? Plunk. <laughs> Plunk. And he's, he's sitting there. He's like, this can't possibly be helping you. I was like, be quiet. We're going to do this. <laughs> You're going to play with me. <laughs> Um, so I, obviously I played, I played with, you know, multiple flute players. I made them play, play William Tell with me too, but I was just trying to like, um, go about it in a, like a collaborative sense. Right. Cause I was going to have to play these pieces with an orchestra. It was different than playing it just as a audition. Um, I remember I watched a whole bunch of YouTube videos to see what conductors did. Um, which just to, it was like, cause I, some of these I had never played. I had never played new world in public until I got my job here. Um, which is another funny story because I played it, I believe, fifteen times my first season because it was on a uh, <laughs> children. It was on a children's concert. <laughs> so I've played New World now, but <laughs> but I hadn't at the time, you know. Um, so uh, I, I did I did all sorts of ways to basically do what what Rob Walter said and just try and like look look at the problem from as many different angles as you could, as I could. Right, I listened to music that was by the same composer, but not the same piece of music, just to kind of like, you know, get my head around, um, around the, the music aspect of it and the playing with an orchestra aspect of it um, over those six weeks. So then I flew back to Atlanta. Um, oh, actually funny story. So after, after that, that final round, before the six weeks, I flew back to Sarasota and then I played a gig in a circus that night. <laughs> it was just like, like the, the, going back and forth was it was it was something else there was like a people in high wire right above my head and I was like I, what where was I yesterday You're like, please, uh, don't please don't follow me <laughs> I have an audition in six weeks um <laughs> so I flew back uh we played you know they, they had one rehearsal dedicated just to these the three of us who came and played excerpts of the orchestra um and we all did our thing and then um and then they offered me the job that day and I uh, that was in March of 2012, and I came down in May and uh, played played a month with the orchestra before I officially started in the fall of 20, 2012. That's so awesome. What what was your reaction when they're like, "We'd like to offer you the job"? Um, I didn't quite believe it. I mean, I, the other two people who were in the finals with me were just so so good. Uh, I really didn't. I I thought that you know, I actually walked out uh, walked out with one of them um, before, like once they whittled it down to three one of them was a friend of mine I went to school with and I walked out with him and I was like you're gonna get this job this is amazing I'm so excited for you <laughs> I really didn't think I had any any shot at it you know um but I uh I I, 
I honestly, like, I don't remember exactly what my reaction was because it's probably just a whole lot of disbelief. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly disbelief and then, wait, what? <laughs> okay, I guess I'm an English horn player now. <laughs> wow, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, what are the main differences for you between, like, making an English horn read and making an oboe read? Mm-hmm. What are the things that you shoot for? Yes, let's get into it. Get, in, get into the weeds. Let's get yeah. into the, the nitty gritty. Okay, so an English horn reed is not the same as a big oboe reed. Um, if you do, if you make what like proportionally a bigger oboe reed, you were going and call it a call it an English horn reed like this. You know, if you were to like do the math and figure out the measurements and all that, um, you would end up with a puny little reed that doesn't give you any dynamics. So an English horn reed is. Um, has a thicker tip proportionally than if it was just a big oboe reed and a thinner heart than if it was just a big oboe reed. Um, so there's many ways you can say, you can say it, that it has a thicker tip. You can say that it has a thinner heart. You can say that it's more blended. I've heard um, uh, Elizabeth Masudnia from the Philadelphia Orchestra talk about English horns reeds just generally being more blended than, than oboe reeds. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is it takes longer for me to make them day wise, not hour wise, but it's, it's a, it's a lot more important for my English horn reeds to sit over the course of several days. Um, you know, you do a little bit, you let it dry out, you come back to it the next day, uh, you work on it, you play on it, you, you know, you let it dry out. So there's, there's a lot more of that, many more days of that in my reed making uh, for an English horn reed than for an oboe reed. So those so are, those are the big things. to a bassoon reed in that way. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, not quite as, I mean, it's not, we're not talking months, right? Like I can, I can make an English one read and play on it a couple days later in rehearsal. Um, or like, it, it's better if I have like five or six days, um, you know, to, and sometimes there's just a lot of playing it in much more so than I do on my oboe reads. Um, I mean, for bassoons, like they, they tie blanks and then like, you know, months later they're doing something. Well, I don't know, Jackie, you tell me, but <laughs> there's like, <laughs> let me tell you about bassoon reads. Um, <laughs> But it just, there's a much, much, much longer process, but it's, it's not quite that dramatic for English one versus oboe. Can you tell us some like very nerdy specifics? Like what oh, yeah. do you use? Like what's your wire situation? Mm, okay. So I use the ready to be shocked. Walter's more. <laughs> 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 Who's surprised? Um, it's uh it's based off of the Minster Lickman tip, which is what I used to use. And what I won my job here on is on the Minster Lickman tip. So the Walters more tipped for me just has a little bit more um, projection and a little bit more spin in the sound. Um, and my, uh, the hall here in Atlanta, uh, you really have to, um, uh, you can't kind of like muscle your way to projection in this hall. This isn't one of those like deep, dark, big round, like you have to have to have a lot of spin and a lot of like, um, I think singers would call it ping in your mm-hmm. sound in order to get it to go out. So um, this tip has, has a lot of that. And I really like it. I also do not use wire on this tip. I have found in my experience that the narrower the tip, the more I feel the need to use wire. And these are slightly wider. They're not as wide as like maybe a fall staff or something like that. But um, I, I, it's not out of the question. Like if a read, if I re- feel like a read is wimpy, like I might put, I'll put some wire on it, but I have not broken out my wire in a couple of years. Um, so that's my, um, that's my, my tip and wire situation. I use an Italani gouge because that's what Chris Philpotts uses. I went up to Cincinnati and made reads with him several years ago. Um, and he gave me some pieces off of his in Italy and it was great. So the an Italy- English horn gouge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've so I have the Italy English horn gouge is fantastic. I love it. I really do. I'm a, I'm a full convert. I have the oboe and I have the English horn. It's like, it's, it feels so much more idiot proof and I don't have to move (laughs) blades around. Like if I don't, you know, like moving gouger blades for me is as far away from what I like to do. I like, you know, playing music. It's, it's like so distant. I, if I don't have to do that, then I, I, I'm happy to do that. So I, yeah, I have an inaletti oboe and an inaletti English horn gouge. Um, I use a Dallas vocal that I bought from um, Pat McFarland when I moved here. When I, when I, he basically got my first paycheck. I got like a, a, a Gilbert, a Gilbert gouge from him. Yeah. A Gilbert gouge an extra bell, a B flat extension and, um, and a, like, like a handful of vocals. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so I, I, I really like, I really like that, that vocal. Um, and the only other thing, um, gear wise, and I do a lot more gear stuff. Well, I guess it makes sense. I do a lot more gear stuff with English horn than I do with oboe. Um, but, um, I, I would like to say to anybody who's listening that if you have problems with your English horn, high C being sharp mm-hmm. and you try and lip it down and it breaks, it comes down the octave. You can't get it. Your, your, um, octave vent is too small and you can get that drilled out and your life will be changed. Ah, yeah. Dead serious. So there's a couple different ways you can do that. You can either buy a new octave vent. Um, Kristen Bertrand sells them. That's what I have. Uh, or you can just go to any repair person and say, can you drill the vent hole out larger? So it's like, it sounds like there's water in there, but there's no water in there. Correct. That's it. It drives me nuts. Yeah. Apparently they, uh, what I have heard is that um, they use, they just use the same octave vent that they use for an oboe. So it's just too small. So you just get any, I mean, it'll take the repair person, like almost no time. I've told so many people at this point that there are probably repair people around the country. Be like, oh yeah, that Emily person is talking about jelly <laughs> out your eyes. But you can't play, you can't play new world in tune. Da, 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 right. Yeah. You can't yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a high C, which is like, needs, you know, it needs to be down to pitch and beautiful and huge. Right. You can't do that with the, the way that the octave is are, are set up on 99% of English ones that I've tried. So you just oh. need to get a drill that one size bigger. You just changed my life. Happy to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, since we're talking about gear anyway, can we hear yeah. about the instruments that you play on and maybe how you came to that choice, how they came into your life? Sure. So on that respect, I'm, I'm very boring. I just play on Lorays. I just play on a Lorray, a Lorray, AK oboe. I play on a normal, regular, everyday Lorray English horn. Um, the English one that I have right now, I again purchased from Pat. It was so nice to have Pat in town. The, so the McFarland Double Read Shop, if anyone doesn't know it, was very big when I was when I was growing up. I had like the catalog, you do like the mail order, you know, read stuff. Um, but he was also my predecessor here in Atlanta. Um, so it was just so great to go over to his apartment and just like try a million instruments. And um, so this one I purchased, I purchased from him. Um, probably six or seven years ago at this point. Um, and I just, I play on a, on a Lorette. We're actually kind of interesting in the Atlanta symphony because we play on, uh, there are four of us and we play on three different brands of instruments. <laughs> um, awesome. yeah. And, and it works It somehow miraculously works, but, um, yes, but I'm, I'm, I'm one of the Lorette holdouts in our, in our section. It's just, I've, I've, once I, if I come across an instrument that I like better, I, I, I'm not, saying I won't ever change, but for right now, the, the, the way the Lorray sounds, especially on English horn, I know that there are some, um, you know, some brands that have been trying to, to, um, make new and different English horns and have really been upping their English horn game. And they're, they're definitely great, but to me, I, I haven't tried any that have, um, felt as comfortable to me as my, my Lorray. So that's, that's what I plan. Everything else is gear. All my other okay. stuff. <laughs> and, like, and then I'm like, I'm like a, vanilla sandwich over here with my, <laughs> my Lorraine, but <laughs> um, are there any memories, uh, favorite memories from a past performance that you'd like to share with us? Sure. So I was, I was thinking about this um, before I came on today and honestly, one of my favorite uh, orchestral memories happened this weekend. Um, this weekend was Robert Spano's last um, performances as music director of the Atlanta symphony. Um, we did Mahler's third symphony, uh, and it was, I, I've, I have never felt so much community on stage as I did this past weekend. We had, and I'm getting all like verklempt thinking about it even right now, but we, there were, you know, it has this like glorious ending, you know, with everyone playing, you know, at their, at their full volume. And I'm looking around the orchestra during the, the performances and there's like just people are crying and everyone everyone's just like so and, and having that again that sense of community that's one of the things that, that Robert has done so well with the Atlanta Symphony is really um uh we all feel we all feel like family I know people say that a lot but it's I really feel like the Atlanta Symphony is something um rather unique uh in that respect and and so much of that is due to Robert's leadership um so that you know the the goosebumps and the tears and the and the the love and respect for each other that everybody had on stage this past weekend was, was something I think I'm going to remember for a really long time. 
That's lovely. Can we now hear a uh, <laughs> memory of an embarrassing moment that you've had? <laughs> yes. So I have, I have an embarrass, I have, I have an embarrassing story, but I also have a really great audition story that I think people might like to hear too. Month and and yeah. month and both. Okay, great. So my embarrassing story. <laughs> okay, so um, this was maybe seven or eight years ago here in Atlanta. Uh, and we were playing um, Dvorak 8, which has, I didn't count before I, I meant to go look up the part, but I believe it's 11 or 12 notes of English horn in the, in the piece. Da, 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 right? 12 notes. Um, so for that reason, I often get put on second oboe slash English horn on that piece. And Dvorak's second oboe parts are notorious, right? They're low and they're quiet and they're touchy. Um, so 99% of that piece is second oboe, 12 notes of English horn. Um, the, the beginning of the week, I got a phone call that Sam Nemec, our second oboist was sick. He couldn't play, which also meant he couldn't play the pre-concert chamber concert, which was going to be the Dvorak serenade. So I was going to play second oboe on the Dvorak serenade and second oboe on whatever the first half of the program was, which I don't remember. And then second oboe in my 12 notes of English horn on Dvorak 8. So the Dvorak serenade just has a really gnarly second oboe part. It's just all low Ds and C sharps, like just and then in octaves with the like pianissimo with principal oboe. And it's just, it's really, really touchy. So I'm, you know, spending most of my energy thinking about that, working on that. So we get through the pre-concert. Everything's great. I play the first half of the program. I get through that. <laughs> okay. I open up my case and I don't have my English horn reads. So scared. At intermission. <gasps> I'm so scared. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm like shaking thinking about this. It's intermission, which is not very long. Especially <laughs> when you don't have, not only did I not have English horn reads, I didn't have any blanks, I didn't have anything. I had two read cases. I had my oboe read case, I had my English horn read case. English horn read case was at home on the desk. So I I got this flash of a memory of my very first oboe teacher, Rita Smith telling me that she had played her very first English horn gig by jamming an oboe reed onto her English horn vocal. <laughs> so I soak up every oboe reed in my case. Oh my God. <laughs> I saw, and at this point, like I'm sitting right next to, to Liz to shown. So she knows what's going on and there's a lot of noise on stage. I can't quite tell like what, you know, how things sound. And I, I soak up every, every read and I jam each one, one by one onto the vocal and Liz is listening and hearing. She's like, that one doesn't sound good. That one, oh no, that one sounds, that one's, and I'm playing, playing my 12 notes. <laughs> She's like, okay, that, I think that one sounds good. So I'm like getting, and this isn't, thank God it's in the first movement, right? So it's, I, I remember it distinctly, it's on the top of the third, the top of the third page. Um, so I'm like getting through like the beginning of this, the, the first movement, like, okay, okay. Okay. And I like, and I, I have my special read, I jam it onto the English horn vocal. I play my 12 notes of English horn. And like, I'm sure I'm bright red at that point with the stress. <laughs> and the conductor was none the wiser. <laughs> it sounded enough like an English horn. I didn't get fired. <laughs> I'm here to tell the tale, but it's, um, I, I told another colleague this, this story uh, a couple of weeks ago and he's like, yeah, that's the, that he, and he was, cause he was telling me that he once forgot his bassoon to a gig. Um, and he's like, yeah, that's the kind of thing that you only do once. <laughs> <laughs> so I am notorious for pulling over on the side of the road and checking to make sure that I are in my case after I've already left the house. I can't yeah. breathe. <laughs> <laughs> the adrenaline going through my body. I cannot I'm imagine sweating. the adrenaline going through yours. Yeah. Oh my God. I know. That's wild. <laughs> First of all, that is very resourceful. <laughs> yeah. Where the, make it work. Tim Gunn, right. make it work. <laughs> what else was I going to do? Sing it? I mean, like... <laughs> so did your read survive being smashed on a vocal? I think, I mean, it, honestly, fit? I, I don't, it, it fit. And I think that was part of what I was testing for is finding one that did fit well enough oh. to make enough sound. So first um, of all, you are incredibly resourceful and you have nerves <laughs> of steel. Second of all, what an amazing colleague 
in this <laughs> to shown. <laughs> She's just like, okay, not that one, that one, that one, that one. <laughs> that, one sounds, that sounds like an English horn. That sounds English horn like. Well, and that reminds me, we do merch for the podcast. And the very first set of merch we did, we had, we were working with an artist who didn't really get what we were talking about. And English was not his first language. And he, there was no read on the English horn. Oh, yeah. And so Galit was like, no, we need a read on top of the English horn. And it was an oboe read on top of the English horn <laughs> vocal. And how serendipitous. Maybe we should see if we have those original drafts. <laughs> you can make them into a t-shirt. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> that was incredible. Thank you for sharing that with us. You're welcome. Do you want to hear my, my favorite audition story too? Yes. Okay. Okay. So in 2010, I auditioned for the National Symphony. They had a principal oboe opening. And um, the uh, I had this tendency because I, I had taken, I was, I was the queen of auditioning. I'd taken like every audition, like I tons and tons and tons of auditions. And for some reason, I had gotten into this pattern where I would get um, uh, advanced out of the semis, but not into the finals. So they would always have like this extra little, not always, there was more than once, there was this extra little round, like pre-final round that I would, I would end up having to play for whatever reason. Um, so this was one of those times um, where uh, what I was told or what I remember is that the, the um, collective bargaining agreement said that the music director only had to listen to three people in the finals. And there were five of us who advanced that, who got enough votes to advance out of the semis. So we had to, we had to do a... Um, what I later found out they were calling a lightning elimination round um, <laughs> <laughs> to get it down to three people so that the music director could come in and hear the three people. So um, I don't know if your orchestral history is up to date, but 2010 was a bad year for the Nashville Symphony. Their building flooded during a massive oh. rainstorm and they lost a bunch of Steinways. That was at the same time that they were trying to hold a Prince Lobo audition on stage. So I show up. Um, in a, a rainstorm that I've never seen the likes of before to the hall. The hall is running on generators at this point because they don't have any power. They're trying to get through their lightning elimination round. <laughs> so what they, they did is they gave us like one or two X, I think it was like two excerpts. I don't remember what the first one was, but the second one was the end of the first movement of Tombo. Um, so, right. So high notes, lots of um, uh, fast moving stuff. So I get on stage, I play whatever the first excerpt was, I don't remember. And then I play, I get to the tombo and I go da 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 and I crack the first high note and the power goes out in the building. <laughs> At that moment, right? And I, I finished and I was like, oh, okay, all right, that's fine. The power went out. They're not going to remember that I cracked that note. They remembered and I got cut. <laughs> oh my God. It was like the voice of God <laughs> was like, like, nope, this, not is not, this, this is not for you. Not, this this is not it. this <laughs> I, I told, I, I do like this story. It's a good, it's a good one. I've told it to a student who actually came back to, I teach at the Brevard Music Center in the summers and he came to Brevard last summer and I started to tell the story in a master class. He's like, oh, let me tell it. Let me tell it. He's like, you know, the lights went out and like, and you played perfectly and you didn't miss any notes and you got to the finals. I was like, I wish that was what had happened. <laughs> and I love that that's how, how you remember it, but that's not what happened. <laughs> so sweet. I know. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was bonkers. I mean, I, I think like literally when I was on stage, like the basement was filling up and they were, they were, you know, a bunch of Steinways were going under and it, it was, yeah, it was, it was bananas. I don't know how that audition ended up happening but they're like all right get, get them going <laughs> get them through that again <laughs> that <is> wild <laughs> um we love to end by asking uh what advice do you have for young musicians who aspire to have a career like yours I think if I was talking to a younger version of myself I would I would really encourage myself not to be so concerned with what other people are doing, not to be so quick to compare and to just spend as much time and energy as I could working on myself and making sure that my, my playing was where it needed to be and was doing what it did. Cause you can't control what anybody else is doing. And you also can't control what any sort of, you know, orchestral audition committee is thinking, right? You don't, you're not going to 
you're not going to know if, you know, there's, there's no way to, to kind of get into the mind of an orchestral audition committee and go, oh, why did that person advance? And I didn't, or this or that. Um, and I spent a lot of time and energy thinking that way. And it was really, really not helpful. Um, I think being, trying to separate a little bit, your personal self-worth from your, um, playing is, is important being able to kind of say, I'm over here and I'm good and I'm good with me. And my playing is something I'm working on. And I'm, I'm, and, you know, I'm allowing myself to have some mental separation instead of having all of my self-worth um, tied up in how I was doing in auditions or how I felt like I was playing. I think that those things are, are easy traps for students to fall into um, or, you know, any of us really to fall into. Um, and I think that that, that would have given me a lot more peace of mind if I've been able to, to do that as a student. So I would really encourage you know, students who feel like they've been wronged or like this person got this and I didn't get that. And like, that's, there's nothing you're gonna be able to do about that. And that's gonna happen all the time. And all you can do is control how you prepare and how you, um, how you practice and how you, you know, your own, your own mindset um, as, you're, as you're taking auditions and as you're moving forward in your career. And I think sometimes that's such a great point. And I think that sometimes we feel like if we have peace of mind, it means we're lazy. Mm-hmm. I know. I remember thinking that way. It's like the day that I'm happy with my playing is the day I know I've lost my edge. I remember yeah. actually like thinking those words when I was in college yeah. and it's, it's, it's so toxic. <laughs> it's so toxic. And it's, it's a, a, uh, you know, a recipe for, for disaster, you know, yeah. in your own, your own mental health and your own way of, you know, of, of being able to keep going. I mean, this, this field is hard enough on us as it is, you know, we don't, you don't need to put those sorts of, of burdens on our, on ourself as well. It's, it's okay to recognize when you've done something well mm-hmm. and it's not, it's not lazy. <laughs> I totally, I totally know that feeling. Well, Emily Brebach, thank you so much for joining us on Double Read Dish. This has been an absolute joy and I can't wait to share it with everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you for enjoying that episode, or we hope you did. And thank you for listening. I combined two sentences. Please follow us on social media and uh, rate and review on iTunes and suggest us to your friends. And Galit, who's coming up on the next episode? On the next episode, we had the pleasure of speaking with the Indianapolis Symphony's Mark Ortwine. Jackie, let's end this nerd parade. Go make reads, Except but you, don't you feel, don't have to, yeah, you yeah, don't have to do it that. It doesn't anymore. have to be 200. No, 70 is like, fine. Uh, even fewer is good. Eight? Eight is great. <laughs>